You're out at a bar, you're talking to that attractive stranger, it seems like it's going pretty well, and then out of the blue, they suddenly ask you, so, are you gonna buy me a drink? What do you do in that situation? Do you go ahead and buy him the drink? Do you politely decline? Do you find some middle way? What is the rule in that situation? What up, it's proverbial boy Jeffy, and today, we're gonna talk about the rules. Some love them, some hate them. Most, quite frankly, don't even know what the hell they are. Now, of course, what I'm talking about here are the general rules of thumb, if you will, that apply not just to socializing, but to any skill or any sort of discipline that might be out there. And the reason that I was thinking about this today, I was reading a book in the restroom, as I am wont to do, one of the many places that I like to do some light reading. And what I'm reading currently is this little volume here, Stephen King on writing a memoir of the craft. Now, as you may know, I dabble in writing a little bit. I wrote a book here and there. Should you always adhere to the strict rules of grammar as outlined in, you know, Strunk and White's Rules of Grammar, the MLA Handbook, you know, these Bibles of grammar? And let me read you a quote from the book here, if I can pick it up off the ground first. King writes, must you write complete sentences each time, every time? Perish the thought. If your work consists only of fragments and floating clauses, the grammar police aren't going to come and take you away. Even William Strunk, that Mussolini of rhetoric, recognized the delicious pliability of language. It is an old observation, he writes, that the best writers sometimes disregard the rules of rhetoric. Yet he goes on to add this thought, which I urge you to consider. Unless he is certain of doing well, the writer will probably do best to follow the rules. The telling clause here is, unless he is certain of doing well. If you don't have a rudimentary grasp of how the parts of speech translate into coherent sentences, how can you be certain that you are doing well? How will you know if you're doing poorly for that matter? The answer, of course, is that you can't. You won't. So the idea here is the rules exist so you know when to break them. For the vast, vast, vast majority of people, especially people who are just starting out in socializing and learning how to be charismatic and interact, you would probably do very, very well to adhere to the groundwork that's been laid out before you by people who have been studying this for many, many years, like myself and my colleagues. I always like to say that the people who, you know, the younger generation of people coming up and trying to learn this stuff, you're standing on the shoulders of giants, or in our case, dwarves, let's just say. So if you want to stand on these dwarfy shoulders, uh, go ahead and let the work and the mistakes that we've made guide you in your quest to gain competence at social interaction, to gain competence at finding romance in the night with you know the object of your affections. So let me give you a couple of examples here of you know what are some of the most very basic rules of socializing. Well, for example, I would say that the number one thing that I always tell students when they come on program, like, like the very, very first thing, when we're out there tonight, I want you to square up dead ass in front of the people that you're talking to. I want you to stand directly in front of them, not 10 degrees off to the side, boom, zero degrees, dead in front, just like I'm looking at the camera right now, so you're looking them in the eye. Now, obviously, this does not mean that I want them to just stand there and, and stare at people with this dead-eyed stare 100% of the time. Obviously, that's going to quickly become creepy as fuck, for lack of a better term. That's lacking social intelligence. But, you know, for the most part, you do want to be making eye contact. You can, of course, glance around from time to time. So it just doesn't seem like this bizarre, neuroatypical stranger glaring at them. But for the most part, you know, you want to be making eye contact in order to sort of own your intention and create that strong connection. When you stand in front, it's like, I've made a decision to engage. We even have an auditory cue that we use on the programs to remind you. We use the word oi, the Australian noise oi, and I'm yelling this oi, oi, oi near them. And you can see that he knows what it means. He understands what we're attempting to communicate, but the, the student could simply not square up. It's just too uncomfortable. The inhibition is too strong. At least that's my assumption. And I'm guessing that when this happens, it likely has something to do with various emotional blocks and inhibitions around showing vulnerability. You know, the eyes are the windows to the soul, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is this. He knew what to do, yet he was flagrantly disregarding the rule, and as such, he wasn't getting the results that he could be. Now, does this mean that you should be literally squared up 100% of the time? Absolutely not. 
But why do I emphasize this so strongly? Well, because again, the vast majority of people can't fucking do it. So once you can do it, then we can talk about when to break the rules. What's another one? The buying of the drinks thing. I had a client a couple of weeks ago. He was doing pretty well. He was talking to someone and, and it was on. It seemed like it was on. And then, you know, this, this girl he was talking to really liked him. And then out of nowhere, he buys a round of drinks for himself and the girl and her friends. She liked him up to that point. But as soon as he bought those drinks, boom, you could see her entire demeanor shift. It just became like, oh, great. It's one of these guys that's attempting to perhaps curry favor with me by purchasing things for me. Or who knows if she even had that much of a conscious thought about it. You know, she just knew that the dynamic shifted all of a sudden. She just didn't respect this guy or she didn't see him in that light that she had been seeing him earlier in as a potential partner. Now she saw him as essentially a fucking chump and the entire interaction just collapsed like a castle made out of sand. Now, what I found personally from decades of going out is that when I'm out and I'm talking to somebody and it's going well, if they ask me to buy him a drink, if I have not already established some sort of romantic connection with them, let for example, if I haven't kissed them yet or otherwise established some sort of, you know, romantic dynamic to the interaction, buying that drink is going to cause that interaction to blow up 95% of the time. Now, granted, there is that 5% of the time and it's just 5% where it's just a rule that this person has. If I'm talking to someone out at the bar, a guy that respects me buys me a drink. You know, the guy's got to buy me a drink for, for me to proceed down the path with him. And sometimes that's just her little idiosyncratic rule. But as I said, that contingency or, or that 5%, it's so small, it's, it's almost negligible. And I have had that happen before where I was talking to some woman literally and she's like, so are you going to buy me a drink? And it was going so well up to that point that I didn't, because I'm like, the rule is don't buy the drink. The rule is don't buy the drink. The rule is don't buy the drink. You know, typically what I'll do if they ask me that before we've established, I've established that beachhead, so to speak, I'll just be like, ha, 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 yeah, anyway, did, like, like it's so ridiculous that, that I, I can't even take it seriously. And then I'll just change the subject because I'm very good at like plowing the conversation. And typically that's enough to handle it. I mean, quite frankly, at this point, they don't even ask me to buy the damn drinks anymore because they can tell I ain't the one just by my demeanor. But I, you know, I used to get a lot more back in the day. Um, and even from time to time, I'll still get it to, to this day, just, just cause it's one of those things. But again, it was going well up to that point. However, like very well, however, I hadn't got that exact confirmation that, okay, we're past that. Will we, or won't we thing, you know, it, it was still kind of up in the air. And so everything in my training, all of my instincts, the years and years of doing this was telling me in every fiber of my being, do not buy the damn drink. If you do that, it's going to ruin it. You've seen it happen countless times before. But she was just so like insistent and there was something very like pointed about the way she was saying it that I kind of got like, hmm, maybe this is that 5%. Like if I don't do it, it's going to ruin it. So I asked her, I, I'm like, do you think it's a good idea for me to buy you a drink? And she goes, yes, Jeff, it is a good idea for you to just buy me this drink. And I was like, okay, I'm going to buy you the drink. And then I bought the drink and then it actually worked out and we ended up, you know, hooking up together. But again, it, it, it was just in that instance, that 5%, it's nearly, it's infinitesimal. It's like such an almost negligible number. And if you're a newer student of social interaction and you've only been doing this for a short time, for you to just buy the drink and say, well, maybe it's that 5% time. The truth is you simply do not have the experience necessary to know when it is that 5%. Even me, when I did it, I was like, everything is telling me here, the, the cues are that I should buy the damn drink, but my experience is telling me that I shouldn't. And as such, I was very conflicted. Fortunately, it worked out. Now, on the other hand, I've also had times where I thought this was gonna be the exception to the rule and I went ahead and broke the rule and then fucked it up. I mean, this happened to me once I recall, I had a date set up through Tinder or something. And before the date, it, it was literally like 30 minutes before the date. And she texted me and she said, Hey, look, I'm going to be bringing my dog along. Is the bar dog friendly? I'm coming straight from the gym. I'm wearing my gym clothes. I said something to the effect of like, wow, zero fucks given, huh? Bringing the dog in tow, coming in the sweaty gym clothes. And she's like, excuse me, what, what's wrong with my dog? 
If, if you love me, you love my dog. We're a package deal. And she's like, now, now I'm offended, motherfucker. And she became offended that I was kind of suggesting she leave the dog at home for the romantic date. I'm like, this doesn't sound like a romantic date to me. This sounds like we're going to be babysitting the dog. And, you know, what if there's a problem with the dog, et cetera, et cetera. And basically she kind of blew me out. And I was like, womp, womp, womp. Because I was really looking forward to going on the date. The very next week, a similar situation came up where, again, date, getting ready to go, and right before the date, she said something to the effect of, hey, look, I could meet up with you right now. Uh, I got my dog with me, and I'm recalling that previous week, and I'm like, oh, well, that ruined it last time, so maybe here I should just throw caution to the wind here. Yeah, fuck it, bring the dog. I show up, and the dog was super cute. Dog was really cool in the bar. We come back to the house, we bring the dog back, and we kind of start, you know, kissing or whatever, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, What's, what is that? What's that smell? And I look down and the dog is just crapped all over the room. There's like massive amounts of dog shit all over the room. Like these like horse sized clumps and it's, it smells quite poorly. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then we had to clean and the dog like peed on the carpet and all this nonsense. Long story short, it totally ruined the mood. She's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Well, well, I, anyway, I gotta go. And I'm like, yeah, you should probably go. So in that case, yeah, I should have said just, you know what, maybe we meet up another time when the dog's not in tow. The rules exist for a reason. Typically, your experience will bear out that they should be observed the vast majority of the time. Now, interestingly enough, sometimes, like I said, number one, with enough experience, you're gonna be able to know when to sort of thread the needle of that 5% exception. But even then, it's probably best just observe the fucking rules because the vast majority of the time, they exist to steer you in the right direction. Now, what's another rule? Generally, I'll tell new students, when you go up and introduce yourself to people, don't ask boring interview style questions. Today, I can actually employ boring interview style questions and, and I can, make it work, so to speak. And that might seem like it's a subversion of the rule, but in this case, it isn't so much a subversion of the rule as it is that I've cultivated the, the skill to such an extent that the rule no longer applies. So what does that mean? One thing I'm always saying is individual choices gain power in proportion to the larger field of choice potential surrounding them. So if all you can do is ask the questions, it sucks. It fucking sucks because that's literally all you can do. You're treading water desperately, hoping you don't run out of the fucking questions. But if you have the ability to completely have a conversation devoid of boring interview style questions, now you've transformed the questions from a default necessity into a choice you can make. And in the process, you've given it power. So again, then you can do that because like I always say, they can tell you're making a proactive decision to to, to kind of be more chilled out, to ask these questions. And at any moment, you could go back to the, you know, the shoryuken, you know, the haduken, you, you bust out some crazy shit and free flow and be, and be completely improvisational. But it's a choice you're making. You learn martial arts so you don't have to fight. Once you've learned that kind of verbal facility, you know, if I ask those boring interview questions, the people that I'm talking to are able to tell that I'm not doing that out of necessity. I'm doing that as a proactive decision just to kind of come at the interaction from a more laid back place. The vast, vast majority of the time, you're gonna to wanna to follow the rules. The rules exist to help you. And you need to familiarize yourself with those rules to the degree where you know them cold. You know those, those rules of grammar cold. But once you start to get a lot of experience under your belt, you'll start to get an intuition, kind of a spidey sense, if you will, for that 5% of the time that the rule should be tossed in the trash bin. And then further beyond that, there's also some rules that only exist as training wheels for somebody who's just starting out on this journey. And then as you start to kind of get on your feet and fly high in the sky like a bird on high, and you actually start to get competency, then those don't need to really be observed at all anymore. So having said all that, I hope if you go out tonight, just stick to the fundamentals, right? The fundamentals are the bread and butter of all of this, right? The flashy stuff that we talk about, you know, these outrageous things you see me do, or hear me talk about sometimes, that stuff's just there for fun. And if you do not have the fundamentals and you try that flashy stuff, it's like I told a student once, like, why can't I say these outrageous things that you and your assistant say? There's a reason the four-year-old can't use the stove, but the 13-year-old can. You gotta master the fundamentals, because as I've always said, the fundamentals are ultimately what's gonna get you the results. 
night in and night out consistently. So anyway, I hope this video has been helpful and informative for you. This is Jeffy and I'll see you next time.